Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm your host, Eddie Joe. This podcast today is going to be about Midodrin in the intensive care unit. Midodrin is an alpha-1 adrenergic agonist that's orally administered. Some people have colloquially called it oral phenylephrine. I think that's a pretty funny name for it. And the reason why it is used both in the inpatient as well as outpatient setting is to restore vascular tone and increase blood pressure. In other words, you want to make the patient's blood pressure look a little bit prettier, you go ahead and you give them this medication if applicable. Again, none of this is going to be medical advice, and I am going to be talking about a lot of things off-label in this podcast. One of the benefits of this medication in the intensive care unit, which is where I work because ultimately I'm an intensive care doctor, is that we can administer it to our patients in order to wean them off of the catecholamine drips a little bit faster. You know, an example of this is if you have a patient who's in septic shock, they're already getting over their shock, they're like on two mics of levofed, you can't quite get that map to be 65, hovering around like 60 or so, you could consider using this medication as a catecholamine sparing agent. More of that below. As I mentioned, a lot of what I'm going to be discussing is off-label. Ultimately, it's challenging to define recommendations and do- dosing strategies as you will look at as I go through all the data. Many times, we provide it to our patients and see what happens. Our utilization of this medication is increasing and therefore our knowledge base has to increase as well. Let's go ahead and get started with the uses and indications right after this short break. It's going to be about 30 second ad, so prepare your, prepare your skip sign now. Hate to interrupt this podcast for an ad, but hey, this is an ad. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There are also creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Thanks. Digging back into the uses and indications, the first thing we need to look at is the FDA approved use. This is the only on-label use is symptomatic orthostatic hypotension. Now, those of us who are familiar with the drug know that we don't really use this very much for it and everything we use it for is off-label. Off-label means that we use it at our own risk. This has, of course, been prescribed to patients for hemodialysis tolerance. You know, the people who need a little bit of help to prevent hypotension associated with ultrafiltration. Ultra yeah, those people get metadrin sometimes before they come in for their dialysis treatment. It's also provided to patients with hepatorenal syndrome to prevent vasovagal syncope, as well as those patients who receive stents in their carotid arteries. You know, going around and messing with those barrel receptors isn't a lot of fun. In my training as a critical care doctor, I did a lot of time in the neuro ICU during fellowship. And I saw many people who were status post carotid artery intervention who were on peripheral phenylephrine for several hours. Perhaps these patients could have benefited from some minadrin. Another off-label indication I found in the literature includes patients with advanced cardiac failure after stunned myocardium. Even though I found this in the literature from a physiologic perspective, I struggle with this quite a bit because... If you think about it, all the alpha is going to cause increased vasoconstriction peripherally, therefore increased afterload and needing the heart to do more work. What this will ultimately do with the increased afterload is worsen cardiac output. But nonetheless, somebody described in the literature, they're publishing stuff, I'm not. So I'm just going to sit back and try to interpret it my own way. Let's talk next about the uses in the intensive care unit with metadrin. Starting patients on metadrin can potentially help avoid a central line. You know, if we go ahead to avoid a central line, we could avoid clapses and all the costs and morbidity associated with that in the future. And I know that there's now data to support utilization of peripheral vasopressors. But this caveat of sparing central lines is not it's not going to hurt. Okay, and fun fun fact, some of the data from peripheral vasopressors is my data. That's probably the only place you're ever going to find my data. As mentioned, avoiding central line insertions keeps the clapses at bay. No, and a clapse, for those who don't know, is the central line associated bloodstream infection. Anyway, another benefit is that this could potentially decrease the length of stay of our patients in the ICU. 
if you think about it, if we're able to wean the vasopressors earlier on these patients, we could make their length of stay shorter. The caveat, of course, is that our hospital medicine friends and colleagues will have to be careful weaning the metadrine off. We don't necessarily want to go ahead and send these patients home on metadrine unless they absolutely need it. From my experience, though, clinically, the hospital medicine folks do a good job of weaning it before the patients get discharged. Let's start digging into the pharmacology of all this. I swear I'm going to try really hard to not get too nerdy with it. But metadrine, as I mentioned before, it's taken orally, and then it's absorbed with a high bioavailability of about 93%. That's a, that's a lot of absorption of this. Then the medication, after absorbed, goes through the liver, and it turns into its active metabolite, dysglymidrin. That's a mouthful. I don't think I'm going to be able to say it properly again. Notice, I tried to make this easy. I did not mention anything about enzymatic hydrolysis because I don't know what that means. Anyway, the, the medication peaks one to two hours after ingestion. And then this metabolite, you know, the one that, that's a mouthful, it's expelled by the kidneys. This is why you have to be careful with this medication in patients who have renal failure. Okay, because it could build up, build up, build up with several doses. People aren't getting rid of it appropriately, and then they get this hypertension that's pretty hard to manage. So keep an eye on this. This is one of the reasons why you don't necessarily want to discharge patients home on this. But the half-life of the actual metadrine is 25 minutes. However, the active metabolite is around for three to four hours. This is why you give this medication three times a day, or better yet, you give it every eight hours. So let's talk about how this works. As I mentioned earlier, it's an alpha-1 adrenergic receptor uh, agonist, which means that it's going to cause vasoconstriction both of the arterial or the venous va capacitance vessels. Sorry for that mouthful. mouthful. Anyway, it, it increases peripheral vascular resistance and augments the venous return. In our critically ill patients, however, and I figure if you're listening to this is because you're interested in the critical care perspective of it. We need to remember the that the absorption parameters are a little bit different. Remember, when we resuscitate our patients, and I know I dwell a lot on the fact that I don't want people over-resuscitated, a lot of times there's bowel edema, and then this could go ahead and uh, alter the absorption of it, okay? So we don't know the exact details of it all, but sometimes if people have a lot of edema, especially in their gut, they're not going to absorb it as well as we want them to. Let's talk about dosing metadrine now. Okay, fine. You decided to make the decision to start your patient on metadrine. Let's go through the FDA approved dose first. And again, it's only FDA approved for orthostatic hypotension. If you're going to do anything other than orthostatic hypotension, it's not FDA approved. For these patients, it's 10 milligrams by mouth three times a day. Okay, but you're not listening to this podcast because you want the FDA approves. You want you want to listen to this podcast because you want to see what they've used in different ICU studies. And they've used doses in these ICU studies showing efficacy from 5 milligrams all the way up to 40 milligrams by mouth three times a day. As a side note, the study that uses 40 milligrams three times a day is the Whitson study. In the show notes, you have links to all the studies I use to basically create these, these lectures, or these podcasts for that matter. From a dosage form perspective, metadrin comes in three different forms, which include 2.5, 5, as well as 10 milligram tablets. A quick pause for a word from our sponsor. I mentioned how it could work, other benefits and such, but let's talk about the side effects, because everything has side effects. Now, you have your regular side effects that you would expect from a medication like this, such as urinary retention, dysuria, chills, shivering, etc. But let's talk about the ones we're really going to worry about in patients who are critically ill. We have to worry about compensatory reflex bradycardia. And you could see this with bradycardia below 50, or you could even see it below 40. And then one of the studies in the show notes, the RISVI study, or the RISV study, R-I-Z-V-I, shows that you could get bradycardia below 50 in about 15% of the patients. And you could get bradycardia below 40 in about 9% of the patients in this study. 
In that same study, you do also see some people who developed ischemic bowel. However, the incidence of that is extremely small at 0.18% in that study. So you have to know about the good. You also have to know about the bad, especially when you're going to be using things off-label.